Well, as I understand, I'm Cassius Marcellus Clay the Six, and my great great grandfather was a Kentucky slave, and he was named after some great Kentuckian. Well, yeah. Cassius Marcellus Clay is a great name in Kentucky, and uh, really, where he was from or where it was all originated, I couldn't tell you. But since I've reached a little fame in boxing, most people want to know where I'm from and. Uh, where did I get that name? But really, I haven't really checked on it, so I see that I'm going to have to go look in the You'll have to look it up. See what it's all about now that I'm getting a little interviews. He was born Cassius Clay, became Muhammad Ali, and is widely hailed as one of the greatest and most influential athletes of the 20th century. The three-time heavyweight champion possessed unrivaled speed and agility inside the ring in an unmatched wit and charisma outside of it. Better bow to die than to come down and Uncle Tom and try, making peace just to live a life. He would come to be celebrated all over the world, a symbol of tolerance and understanding, but was militant and confrontational in his youth. His first title bout came in 1964. Few thought he had much of a chance. In 1964, the champion was Sonny Liston, and he was absolutely unbeatable. Cassius Clay was the 7 to 1 underdog. The New York Times sent me down there with these instructions. As soon as I got to Miami, rent a car, drive back and forth between the arena where the fight was going to be held and the nearest hospital, so I would waste no time following Cassius Clay into intensive care. But Clay dominated the fight. He eluded Liston's fists, and by the sixth round, was hitting the champion virtually at will. I, I think that they feel now that, that Clay have all the comfort that he needs and go home and defeat our son in. When Liston didn't answer the bell for the seventh round, Clay became the heavyweight champion of the world. It was clear from the very beginning that Clay was going to be a different kind of champion. Brash, outspoken. You have a mark on my face, yeah. and I upset son in Liston, and I just turned 22 years old. I must be the greatest. Soon after his victory, he joined the Nation of Islam and changed his name to Muhammad Ali. But many people and many publications, including the New York Times, continued to call him Cassius. I said, listen, I'm real sorry about this, but this is out of my control. And he patted me on the head and said, don't worry, you're just a little brother of the white power structure. <laughs> Some asked if he might officially change it, as a reporter did in this press conference captured by KTVU news cameras. <laughs> Who would have to face the judge? The judge is what color? I don't know. He's white. Probably. So in other, words, I, in, other, in other words, I'd have to ask a white man, may I call myself Muhammad Ali boss? <laughs> he was very sensitive about my rightful name. And on, in several very cruel fights, one with Floyd Patterson, one with Ernie Terrell, he taunted them, didn't knock them out when he could have because he wanted to inflict more punishment because they insisted on calling him Cassius Clay. Floyd dreamed he beat me, he'd apologize. <laughs> he'd rather run through hell in a gasoline smoke coat. He tortured Floyd. It was like a little boy picking the wings off a butterfly. He would just, uh, he would just kind of punch Floyd and step back. After Patterson, Ali defeated George Tuvalo in March 1966, and then Henry Cooper in a six-round TKO in May. He knocked out Brian London in only three rounds in August, beat Carl Millenberg in 12 rounds in September, and defeated Cleveland Williams in a three-round technical knockout in November, in what many experts consider to be the most dominant performance in Ali's career. Four months later, in an interview with Howard Cosell on ABC Sports, Ali almost came to blows with Ernie Terrell. That's what you are, uh, Uncle Tom. Why are you going to call me Uncle Tom? What you going to You heard me. Ernie Terrell somehow got boxed into you know, standing up for the establishment. And that was you know, another terrible and ugly fight. This was the, the mean and cruel street. Terrell would not call him by his name, y'all call him uh, Cassius. And so when he just punished him, now he was like, what's my name? Steady to humiliate him. I hardly think it's necessary. Don't you agree, Joe? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know about that. I think Clay can do what he want to do in the ring. 
Finally, in March 1967, Ali defeated Zora Foley. He had won 29 fights in six and a half years, one of the most extraordinary runs in heavyweight boxing history. Although he didn't know it at the time, it would be three and a half years before he fought again. When Ali refused induction into the armed forces, the State Boxing Commission suspended him and stripped him of his title. The country was pulling apart, and he's caught right in the middle of it. It's wave after wave of TV reporter, radio reporter, they all came in. You know, in a few minutes you're going to be, you know, in the front lines. And, and then black Muslims would come and they say, oh, some cracker sergeant going to drop a hand grenade down into your pants. Um, and he was wild and he was exasperated. And late in the evening, I remember standing here, late in the evening, the last radio reporter comes and goes, so champ, how do you feel about being reclassified and going to Vietnam? And then he said, I ain't got nothing against them Viet Cong. The phrase was refined. I got no quarrel against them Viet Cong. No Viet Cong ever called me a nigger. He refused to step forward to be drafted. He was stripped of his title, but he stood firm. The heavyweight champion of the world is telling people that you can take my belt, you can take my championship. And that introduced a lot of us to courage, to honor, to valor. It's not just about running fast, jumping high, but what do you stand for? What are your morals? What are your principles? What stand will you take? What are you willing to risk? So for the next three and a half years, he couldn't fight, and he had to make a living mostly by speaking engagements on college campuses. And in the beginning, he was terrible. First of all, first of all, I would like to thank the student governing body for in Inviting me here. In the course of that, in the Q and A's after, as they asked him political questions, he would begin to understand the main threads of American life. You my opposer when I want justice. You my opposer when I want equality. You won't even stand up for me in America for my religious beliefs, and you want me to go somewhere and fight, but you won't even stand up for me here at home. And by the end of those three and a half years, he became a principal man, and, and that really became his importance in America. My conscience won't let me go shoot uh, some poor hungry people in the mud for big powerful America and shoot them for what? They never called me nigger. They never lynched me. They didn't put no dogs on me. They didn't rob me of my nationality. Shoot them for what? How can I go shoot them? Them little poor little black people, little babies and children and women. How can I shoot them poor people? I would just take me to jail. Ali won his appeal in 1970 when a federal court upheld his bid for a state license. He quickly got back to work, beating Jerry Corey and Oscar Bonavino. His chance to reclaim his titles came in March 1971 against his old friend Joe Frazier. It was dubbed the fight of the century. Today now, 40 years later, uh, a lot of people, because of their, their, their love of Ali, think Ali probably won that fight. Joe Frazier beat him up. And I can remember him saying, when a man gets me going, that's a real punch. And when he knocks me down, that's a real punch. And uh, Joe Frazier had knocked him down. And in a way, I'm part of that knockdown. If you look past Ali, you'll see three gentlemen from the New York Times, Arthur Daly, Bob Lipside, and myself. And the way you can find me is I had a a pen in my mouth. And in the photo, it looks like a mustache. But look, trust me, it was a pen. It was Ali's first professional loss. Even though the decision was undisputed, he continued to talk trash about Joe Frazier every chance he got, wherever he was. Are you Joe Frazier? Are you Joe Frazier's nephew? Is he related to you? Well, it's pretty, this Ali defeated a dethroned Joe Frazier in January 1974, but his next championship bout wasn't until 10 months later when he squared off against George Foreman in a match in Zaire, dubbed the Rumble in the Jungle. Most people, including myself, thought Foreman would demolish him. There were 60,000 people in a soccer stadium yelling, Ali Boumaye. Well, what, what that meant was Ali kill him. Woo! 
Woo! I'm gonna get my soul and my spirit. One hundred thousand African brothers hollering Ali Boumaye, and I'm. Oh. Ali had had told them that Foreman was a Belgian. He wasn't, of course. But when they told him that, they wanted to believe it. And Foreman was the enemy. That fight was just masterful. He just blew Foreman's mind. You know, he, he completely, as much as one competitor could completely turn someone inside out, Ali had completely turned Foreman inside out. He could back off into the ropes and let Foreman pummel him. And Foreman would just smash his ribs and everything. And finally, Foreman just kind of punched himself out. And Ali threw a right hand in the eighth round. I looked up and Foreman spun and went down and just had no energy to get up. If three years after he had lost the trip, and now suddenly everybody loved him. That's sports. That's the way it works sometimes. This is the most joyous scene ever seen in the history of boxing. Only a few months later, he found himself abroad again, this time in Malaysia, to defend his title against Joe Bugner. They had never had a heavyweight title fight in Kuala Lumpur, and they were making a big thing out of everything, including the selection of the gloves. They brought them in on a pillow. Each fighter tried on his gloves and everything. And then after the, after the, all the selection, they put them back in the boxes. And then, then they sealed it. They sealed the boxes with wax from a candle. And they literally were going to put them in a safe inside a jail cell and padlock the cell so nobody could p tamper with the gloves. And now he said, the gloves are going to jail. The gloves are going to jail. The gloves ain't done nothing yet. Muhammad Ali was fun to be around. He was an entertainer. He was a pleaser. I remember once he had done an exhibition in Florida on a field, on a makeshift ring, and his dressing room was a recreational vehicle. And after uh, his exhibition, he went back to the recreational vehicle and shooed everybody out, looked around the crowd, picked out three cute young women, brought them in, sent two of them out, door closed, and the wrecked vehicle began to shake back and forth. The trainer, the PR guy, the, his masseuse, everybody said, this is off, off the record, don't ever write about it, because you'll never talk to him again. But I figured, you know, there were hundreds of people in this field standing around who had seen this. It was a public event. How could you not write about it? So that's how I ended the New York Times Magazine piece. And the editors put uh, the headline on it, King of All Kings, because he had referred to himself somewhere along the way as King of All Kings. So now it's six months later, and they send me down to the movie set of The Greatest, his faux autobiography. The moment I got there, I heard Bob, and he came running over, and he grabbed me and said, King of all kings, you got that right. He did have this grandiosity about him, and he, he was a narcissist. And I think there were some dark parts of him, which you can't avoid. But perhaps the darkest was kind of a vicious attack on Joe Frazier, calling him an Uncle Tom, you know, calling him a gorilla. I will beat the gorilla in the thriller in Manila. And later on, ascribing all of this to our wow, we kind of beating the drum for the box office. Well, somehow that's even worse. Uncle Tom. Why do you say that? Don't insist on calling me Clay. Oh, Uncle Tom. Frazier supported Ali's stance on Vietnam. He even lent him money when Ali wasn't fighting. But what started as a friendly rivalry in the ring became something altogether different. Frazier was hurt and angry when they faced off for the third time in the Philippines. God, it had to be a, a hundred degrees in that arena. And it was a brutal fight, brutal. I mean, I call it an epic in brutality, and it was. I mean, you couldn't, there was never a slow movement. I mean, the punches were brutal. And also by that time, four years after the, uh, the first fight in, in the garden, 
They were older and slower. They really couldn't get out of each other's way. So every punch landed. It was stopped in the 15th round by Joe Frazier's trainer because his left eye had been closed and he couldn't see Ali's right hand punches coming. So he stopped it. Even though he thought Frazier was ahead, he stopped the fight because he didn't want Joe to get hurt. One of the first questions, if not the first, somebody said to him, Mohammed, what a, what a brutal fight. What was it like in that ring? We'll never forget. All Ali said was, it was next to death. Frazier lost to Foreman again and then retired. Ali fought ten more times, defeating Koopman, Young, Dunn, Norton, Evangelista, Shavers. He lost his title to Leon Spinks in 1978, won it back later that year, and lost it for the last time to Larry Holmes in 1980. Larry, I'd like you to explain why you've been crying. You know, I really respect Ali a whole lot. It hurt you to punish him that way, didn't it? But still, Ali fought on. He finally retired after losing to Trevor Burbick a little over a month before his 40th birthday. Two years later, Dave Anderson caught up with him before Ali left on a Goodwill tour. He was probably a few pounds heavy, so he was, was going through some training, just light training, but something to get the weight off. That's the first time I noticed that he was slurring his words. And as we all know, that got worse and worse and worse and worse. I mean, it's, it's been a terrible, terrible scene for ye years with Mohammed. Ali's decline was as rapid as it was dramatic. He appeared in public less and less frequently as time went on. But despite his obvious difficulties, he never lost his spark. I think he's an enormously interesting character. I think that he may have been the greatest fighter we've ever seen. I think that he's an amazing window on a historical period. As a human being that I knew and traveled with, I loved him. Uh, there were things about him I hated, but I loved him as a human being, and he was pure fun. I saw him at the Olympics in Sydney, Australia. And by this time, the Parkinson's had begun to ravish him. But I remember meeting him uh, at some little event. And there was just, again, it was a small gathering. And so, um, you know, I introduced myself, reintroduced myself to him. And I said, uh, he said, yeah, what's your, it was by this time he started, he said, what, what's your name? And so I said, uh, my name is Bill Rowe. He said, no, no, no. What's your real name? I never told you my name is Cassius Clay. Mm -hmm. My name is Muhammad Ali, and you will announce it right there in the center of that lane. You must listen to me. I'm the king of the world. I'm a bad man. I took up the world. I took up the world.